John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul lift up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Use me, Lord, that your people might be blessed. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, today we get to part three of our church-wide Lenten study and sermon series on the prodigal God by Timothy Keller. Can you believe that this is our seventh annual Lenten study? As a pastor over adult discipleship, I'm tasked with selecting and organizing the Lenten studies. I've, each year, I pour over numerous books and consult with our church staff and my clergy colleagues, as well as adult Sunday school and small group leaders. We study the spiritual disciplines, why bad things happen to good people. We study the ministry of Jesus and the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But this year, the prodigal God struck a nerve. This year, it was as though, okay, now you're getting personal. Now we're bringing up birth order and sibling issues and questions of fairness about who gets the bigger half of the cupcake. Yeah. <laughs> and we're comparing all of these things that make for good family tension to what it's like in the kingdom of God, using it as a metaphor for the kingdom of God. This year, we're, this week, we're focusing on the chapter on redefining sin. And I've chosen the title, Saints and Sinners, because I really believe that it is and will show that it's a false dichotomy. But we'll get back to that in a moment. But first, let's look at what Timothy Keller says in this chapter on redefining sin. We're really meant to see ourselves in this parable. And if you look at it, you will see that the elder son and the younger son really represent two alternate paths that people use to find fulfillment and happiness in life. And you can follow along in your outline in the bulletin. And these two paths are moral conformity and self-discovery. The elder brother chooses the path of moral conformity. He corresponds to the Pharisees and the scribes who would have been listening to Jesus tell this parable. They represent the belief that you can only maintain God's blessing and receive ultimate salvation through strict adherence to the law. The moral conformists believe that the world is made right through moral rectitude. And the world would be a better place if people just followed the rules and did what they were supposed to do. The younger brother chooses the path of self-discovery. He corresponds to the tax collectors and the sinners who are also listening to Jesus tell this parable. They represent a belief that one must be free to pursue their vision of the good life, free to choose self-actualization regardless of the customs and conventions of the day. Younger brothers believe that the elder brother is just narrow-minded. 
and that he should be more open-minded, and that the world would be more a better place if there were fewer rules and more personal freedom to make choices. We're meant to see ourselves in this parable. Can you begin to identify and maybe see where you fall on this elder brother, younger brother spectrum? Well, maybe I can help you out. <laughs> I suggest that we play a game called You Might Be an Elder Brother If. <laughs> you might be an elder brother if you heard that the sermon was about sin and wished that Cousin Ted could be here to hear <laughs> If you think that a sermon about sin is not about you, you might be an elder brother. <laughs> you might be an elder brother if you say, a place at the table, I deserve VIP seating at the table. <laughs> if you think that you deserve a front row seat in the kingdom of God, you might be an elder brother. You might be an elder brother if when bad things, when something bad happens, you think, hey, I've been so good. I attend church regularly. I pay tithes. I follow the rules. I don't deserve this. Can I just say that if perfect attendance is a criteria for, not, for bad things not happening, then girlfriend, God must have misread my attendance record. <laughs> I'm a preacher's kid. I've been in church all, literally all, of my life. How many people know that following the rules does not provide a free pass against suffering in the world? Amen. 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 By contrast, younger brothers, you're not getting off so easy. <laughs> you might be a younger brother if, at some point in your life, you've been afraid to come to church because you feel that you've just messed up too much. I haven't been to church and I can't remember when. I've done this, I've done that. There's no way I can go to church. Can I just tell the younger brothers out there today, you don't get cleaned up to go to church. You go to church to get cleaned up. <laughs> you might be a younger brother if you say sit at the table, Forget that I'd be lucky if I could just wait at the table. Just be wait staff for the table in the kingdom of God. And just let me be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. You might be a younger brother if when something bad happens, you think you probably had it coming. You think you probably got what you deserve. Not knowing that the word of God says that God causes the sun to shine on the righteous and on the unrighteous, and send rain on the just and unjust. And here's the real kicker. You might be a younger brother if you're not even here. Think about all of the younger brothers in our family, in our neighborhood, at our workplace, in our world just waiting for an invitation from us to come home. Are you beginning to see yourself in the story? Are you beginning to see where you might fall in this parable? We could easily categorize elder brothers and younger brothers as saints and sinners, but I believe that that would be a false dichotomy. I believe we find out why in Romans 3, 23, which tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah. All of us, at some point, sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the Greek word for sin is hamartia, which means missing the mark. How many in here have aimed 
for the mark. Aim for the target of living right. Aim to be Christ-like and do the right thing. But sometimes, just miss the mark. Sometimes, just miss the target. Come up short of the glory of God. Sin, my friends, another way of looking at it, is whatever alienates you and leaves you estranged from God, estranged from one another, and even estranged from yourself. Sin is that which alienates us from God. And here's the problem. Both moral conformity and self-discovery, outside of a relationship with Christ, outside of understanding Jesus' message that we're called to be in a relationship with him, both paths can lead to sin and both can lead to estrangement from God. Most of us understand this with the younger brother, right? In Act 1, he chooses to go away from the father. He chooses to estrange himself and to cut off the relationship by going away. But did you pay attention to Act 2? In Act 2, it's the elder brother who is estranged from the father. And get this, he's estranged because of his moral conformity. He says, wait a minute, I've done everything right. I follow the rules. I deserve better than this. I deserve a party too. And it's the elder brother. When the father is having a feast, the elder brother is the one on the outside refusing to come in. Friends, not following the rules, if done with the wrong motive, can leave you as estranged as those who don't follow the rules. <coughs> both the elder brother and the younger son, the younger brother, both wanted what the father had and did not want the father. Are you beginning to see yourself in the story? All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But friends, I believe today that there is good news. Are you ready for some good news? Yeah. We say the good news every time we say the Apostles' Creed. We say I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. What else? The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. What that means, the communion of saints, it doesn't simply refer to those who are gone on, but it refers, really, it can also be translated as a community of the holy. It refers to all of us here who have made a decision to try to live holy. Yeah. And because of that decision to seek forgiveness of our sins, it refers to all of us all of us in the body of Christ, all of us who join a community of faith, all of us who aim for the mark. To be a saint means that regularly you try to aim for the mark. But uh, sometimes you miss the mark. Sometimes you fall short. But because of the grace and love of God and Jesus Christ, we can receive forgiveness of sin and be brought back into relationship with God. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory, but all of us are invited back into a communion of saints and the forgiveness of sin. And this faith journey of ours consists of a continuous juxtaposition between trying to get it right, missing the mark, and seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. And because of that, we're all in the same boat. Because of that, elder brothers and younger brothers alike need to seek, continually need to seek the love of God and the love and to be in relationship with God and reconciliation with God. My friends, 
here is the good news. Sinners and saints are in the same boat. And I believe that the moral of the story is that because all saints are really sinners, all sinners can become saints. Oh, yeah. All of us are in this together. All of us are saints and sinners alike. All of us live with this contradiction, this juxtaposition. All of us simply seek to be in the presence of God, to be seated at the table of God's love and reconciliation. But how is this made possible? How is it even possible that saints who are once sinners can be made saints and brought back into fellowship with Jesus Christ? I believe that we find the answer in one of our favorite scriptures on this date of 316. We can find it in John 316, which simply says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Friends, younger brothers, God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Yeah. Friends, God's love is shown in this, that while we were yet sinners, yeah. Christ came into the world for whosoever, whosoever desires to be in a relationship with God, whosoever believes in him, whosoever is willing to repent of their sins. All of us are included in the whosoever. Red, yellow, black or white or brown, you are included in the whosoever. Yeah. Whosoever male or female, whosoever rich or poor, whosoever able-bodied or disabled, whosoever LGBT or straight, whosoever rich or poor, all of us are included in the whosoever. Yeah. Whosoever will. Is there anyone in this room who falls outside of the category of whosoever? Raise your hand right now. Isn't that good news today, friends? All of us are invited to the table. All of us are welcome into the table of God's love Reconciliation. Amen, amen and amen. Won't you stand at this time?